Fetas plays an important role in the governance and management of all schools in South Africa. In the sense that there are so many legal aspects and governance matters in education, of which most principals and educators still have limited experience. It is important for a school to be a member of FETSAS as not only are we the leaders in school governance and management, but we also train, inform, guide and advise all our members in best practice and experienced solutions. Who is FETSAS? FETSAS is the national representative organization for school governing bodies. FETSAS informs, organizes, mobilizes and develops its members to achieve and maintain the highest international standards in school governance and management. We advise within the public and private educational sectors, focusing on the foundation, intermediate and senior phases. The school's governing body or SGB operates primarily outside the classroom. It is the SGB's task to make sure everything outside the classroom is in shape that infrastructure, discipline, budgets, human resources and finances are efficiently managed. FETSAS can assist you with all the aspects of your school governing board's primary role, which is creating a conducive environment in the best interest of the school. Furthermore, FETSAS can assist in strategic planning, sound financial management and human resources aspects such as appointment, discipline and termination of contract processes. When dealing with appointments of principals, FETSAS wants to support you to appoint the best possible leadership candidates for your school, for the sake of our children. Be a part of FETSAS and know that you are part of a larger community that will always provide you with the latest information which is accurate and reliable. There is always someone within FETSAS who has the experience of past challenges and solutions, simply a call away. We at FETSAS will walk alongside you to take your governing body forward to achieve greater heights. FETSAS has extensive experience in education matters. As an active, dynamic organization, it is fully informed of developments and restructuring in the education field and can advise its members accordingly. FETSAS is a democratic, non-political organization and members elect their leaders along the lines of the national school governing body elections. What does FETSAS stand for? FETSAS believes in maximum autonomy for governing bodies and therefore strives to expand governing bodies' rights, competencies and skills. FETSAS supports and promotes governing bodies' powers and the rights as defined in the legal framework of the Constitution. South African Schools Act and Acceptable Governance Principles. Former State President Nelson Mandela said, Education is the most powerful weapon you can use to change the world. Education is a great engine for personal development. Through education, the daughter of a peasant can become a doctor. Children of mine workers become heads of mines. The child of farm workers can become president of the country. Here at FETSAS, we do what we do because we love our children, we love our schools and we love our country. We look forward to being of service to every school governing body in South Africa. Goedenavond allemaal, dit is op die kop sessie. Welcome to everyone. Um, and we are hosting the panel discussion this evening regarding drug abuse. I quickly want to share my screen with you. There you go. Welcome to everyone. I see we've already got a a lot of participants here and um, we are going to discuss drug abuse as I've said. Ons praat vanavond oor dwelle misbruik and although we are going to talk about drug abuse, we are actually go, we actually refer to all substance abuse. We're going to talk about drug abuse but it's actually all 
substance abuse. My name is Ilse Widendal and I'm the Deputy Manager of FETSAS in the Eden and Central Karua District. And uh, with me are all the other managers, but they are in the background. So I just want to um, just reiterate it that this is not a Q&A session. We are only to, going to have a panel discussion. So here is not a question and answer session. We are going to have a panel discussion. Maar ons gaan in elkeen van jullie wat vraag en gestuur het op jullie registratiebladzij, gaan ons persoonlijk hanteer. So, alhoewel ons nie jullie vraag in hierdie sessie gaan beantwoord nie, sal ons by jullie vraag uitkom en ons sal vir jullie e-post stuur. So, although you've asked us questions on your registration page, we're not going to deal with those questions at this session, but we will um, answer it by email by the different managers in our districts. So the purpose of this panel discussion is firstly to give you context of what our schools and our communities are dealing with. Waarmee sit ons skole en waarmee sit ons weer die gemeenskappe and um, how big the problem is but also to give you hope. We don't want to leave you with this big problem and not give you hope. It's all, we will work for you los met whip. Daar, daar, daar is whip and daar is oplossings. Hierdie gaan a kwartaalikse uh, paneel bespreking wees. So, uh, ons wil hierdie opvolg met nog paneel besprekings om op die ouwende tools en, en um, contactpersone vir julle te gee wat julle kan help met hierdie, uh, met hierdie probleem. So this is just the first session of discussions. So let me introduce to you the panel. That is our, those are our panelists. We're going to start off with Quinton Adams. Um, I'm going to ask Quinton, I think his camera is open. Quinton is, and I'm going to read this, uh, to you. Quinton is an educational psychologist, ethnographic researcher, author, and director of Mesekane Development Solutions, a Cape Town based consultancy. He specializes in sustainable social interventions and has vast knowledge and skills in community transformative practices. Um, he was a full-time lecturer and now part-time at the University of Stellenbosch. He has presented widely on his research focus areas at national and international conferences. He is the founder of three project, projects. Discipline starts at home, the shack builders and the backyard varsity, which is a skills development program for unemployed young people. Quinton, welcome. And then also, um, our second panelist is Ava Swartz. Ava is a youth pastor who works in areas of leadership, skills development, cultural conversations, and mentoring with teenagers and young adults from all backgrounds in South Africa. He holds an honors degree in the theology from the University of Pretoria. He's also the author of the Philoresian Fanny Chaiki, wherein he tells his story of a drug addict and gang member, and he's just finished. If I say just finished today, he, just, he, he, he finished that, the second book today. He's just finished his second book on depression and the stigma around it that will be released in September of this year. Ava, welcome. And then our third panelist is Neville Goliath. Neville is a behavior specialist with the WCED and co-presenter of the weekly radio program that essentially focuses on educational support to empower parents as partners in education. He's also the head and manager of the Positive Behavior webpage that aims to engage positive behavior practitioners that find themselves in responsible roles as teachers, parents, community workers, and healthcare practitioners. Neville, bye welkom hier so by ons. 
I and then think. lastly, then lastly, Dr. Yaku Deacon. Yaku, he's our CEO of FETSAS. Um, Yaku, welcome to the panelists. All right, that is the panelists. Thank you. And now, now I'm going to, um, sorry, I think, where is Neville now? Neville? You can keep your, yes, you can keep your, you all can keep your, there you go. Okay. So, um, Quentin, I'm going to start with you. Um, I just want to tell everybody I've had discussions with them. So, if I, if I ask questions about our discussions, it, it's about our previous discussions. It's, it's not the discussions that's going on now. Okay. So, Quentin. As an ethnographic researcher, you are involved in the Western Cape gang control plan. So why did drug addiction escalate at this pace that we are dealing now? Why is it happening at this pace? Well, thank you very much, um, uh, Ilse and participants uh, for being part of this uh, online a discussion around uh, drug abuse. I think it's very interesting that we have, there are three factors um, that are very interesting that contributes to the incidence of drug abuse, especially um, on the Cape Flats. The one is the, the problem with broken homes at, at this point in time. We see that there's a lot of family breakdown. Um, the families are under tremendous pressure and most of the parents cannot cope with the challenges that uh, these young people are facing. Secondly, is the problem of um, learners that drop out of school. Um, they don't have the necessary skills. They don't have the skills to enter the labor market. And therefore they are looking for something that they can get money or an income. And then they become part of the the gangster culture, and um, you cannot separate the gangster culture from, from the drug culture. And what is very interesting and in what I've discovered in my, in my research on the Cape Flats, I was responsible for looking at um, gangs across the Western Cape. And we found that most of these young people, they become part of the drug culture. Um, not only as users, but as an economic activity, because they can't get jobs, they can't get entrance into the labor market. And so they become part of the, what we call the drug and gang value chain. So the income they derive from um, selling drugs. And of course, the, the places where they sell most of the drugs um, are the schools in, in the Western Cape, because that's the place where they have the, the biggest market share or biggest market. And then the third one that is very interesting is that there are generally a lack of counseling support services for young people in this province. Um, I know the Western Cape government has implemented various programs, but I think it's not enough. Um, the unemployment rate is skyrocketing at this point in time. There's not enough psychosocial services outside um, the different departments and uh, the schools. And that's why you see that because of these three factors combined, that we have a big problem with learners that engage in what we call crystal meth or, or all the other drugs. And what is interesting is that the United Nations Office on Drugs has found that South Africa has the highest rate of drug incidence amongst young people. So our young people are really under siege in the Western Cape. And that's why we see um, the spike and the incidence, high incidence of drug yeah. abuse amongst young people. Okay, yeah. So, okay, that was now from your research. Okay, so from a psychological point of view, why is the substance dependency so high? I think it's important to understand crystal meth. Um, crystal meth, first of all, is a very cheap drug. And during my research and uh, what I was doing is that you 
the cheaper it becomes, it, the more accessible it becomes. Yeah. But it is also about the psychological aspects and dynamics regarding the, the use of crystal meth specifically. First of all, it increases um, your energy level, which is very important to understand. Secondly, it increases your libido, your sex drive. So most of the places where metafetamine or crystal meds are, are being used, you will see there's also a spike in um, sexual offenses like rape and molestation because of the increase in the libido. And a very interesting uh, psychological aspect is it decreases boredom, which means that crystal meth is really between brackets, a solution for the challenges of what young people are facing. They are facing depression, they're facing low drive, they uh, don't have uh, enough energy because of this hopelessness and learned hopelessness. And it has become a, a substitute for the real experiences of young people. And that's why most of these young people, they experiment with this kind of drugs to feel better, to feel better about themselves, to feel more energy. And what we've discovered uh, with, with, the, with the, most of these people that we work with over the past years is that when you talk to the parents, then they, the parents will say, but they're more confident, they're more talkative, mm -hmm. they, um, they feel better about themselves. But that only lasts for six to 12 hours. And after that, they will um, have problems again with side effects. And what is interesting is that Crystal meth, and I did a presentation a few years ago to the premier of the Western Cape, really exposed the real problem of, of young people. So sometimes I used to say it's not a drug problem, it's a youth problem that we are facing. And that reflects on the real challenges, um, the, the low drive, the, the depression, the anxiety, the fear that these young people and um, that's why they engage in, mm. in, in crystal meth, especially mm. in the Western Cape. Mm. Mm. Neville, um, I want to get to you from a uh, from the from the WCED side. What is the impact of drug abuse on the delivery of education in our schools? Yeah, so uh, drug use by, by learners in schools across the province, um, I must say, is a growing concern for the Western Cape Education Department. Uh, we have come out of a lockdown period uh, due to the COVID-19 pandemic, and we find ourselves, and Quinton spoke about psychosocial support, we find ourselves busy assessing the emotional and social well-being of learners at the moment. And what we found is that um, uh, there's been a spike in drug use, and also uh, we observe this in, in, in schools, that, that there's an increase in, in, in activity in, in, in school playgrounds. We cannot attribute everything to COVID-19, I must say, because uh, pre-COVID, uh, the schools uh, have encountered lots of these problems in any case. It was there before, but I must say, uh, due to COVID-19, uh, learners have acquired certain habits you know, in, during the two years of being in lockdown, and, and they brought all of those habits back into the school frame based on what allowed them to, to, uh, to overcome the boredom, like the previous speaker referred to, and they bring this into school spaces. And this automatically placed all of those learners in the category of youth at risk, and they place themselves in this vulnerable position. Now, drug dependency has especially hit the youth hard. And you would all know that the average age now is uh, 12 years and younger of drug use. Now, in South Africa, is also uh, the, one of the top 10 countries in the world for narc narcotics and alcohol abuse. And the common use, as you would know, would be Dacha or cannabis would be the common thing that's out there, and also methamphetamines uh, or tick, as, as we would know it. Um, but the, one of the things that, that has increased is over the counter drugs. We found that in schools, and, and you would all know the term Xanax, and in certain regions of, of the Western Cape Education Department, uh, Zan has become one of the things that, that has popped quite a lot because it's easily attainable. But the drug that's still the highest is alcohol. Where, where, where kids are exposed to alcohol. Now, all of that 
comes into the school frame and, and, and schools have to deal with that. Uh, drug testing in schools is a method used to identify and prevent drug use. Although motivated by positive intentions, intentions drug testing in schools can result in stigmatization and victimization of learners involved. And, and that is something we are very much aware of and, and try to guard against. Schools should be guided by clear policies on the prevention and treatment of drug use. Now, the South African Schools Act acknowledges random drug searching, seizures, and testing that it can infringe on the basic rights of, of learners. However, the South African Schools Act maintains that when done according to the stipulated guidelines, drug testing can yield beneficial results. Furthermore, the Act gives the school's principals the liberty to act in the best interest of their child. So responsibility sits on that principle, but also to act in the best interest of the staff of that school. Now, against that backdrop, the Western Cape Education Department needs to deal with, uh, with, with, with drugs coming into schools, into classrooms and playgrounds. Now, what impact does it have on the learner? And I think uh, uh, Dr. Adams have alluded to that. The one thing initially when a child uses drugs, uh, he will be able to conceal it initially. Until later, you become aware that this child's intoxicated. Now, intoxication would be one of the first things that, that uh, would impact on the child's ability to learn within the school uh, environment. And the disruption of the classroom environment would be the next thing. The more and more child would be allowed to do that and children come into the space, uh, disruption of, of the classroom, that would lead to poor discipline. So discipline would also be impacted, which in, could include aggression. Kids could tend to be aggressive depending on what substance they use or depending on how the substance reacts to, to, to uh, the person. And that would feed into poor academic performance, which leads to dropping out of school. Some people would say uh, the child drops out of school and use drugs, but many kids drop out of schools because they are using them. <laughs> and, and, and that would lead to the child possibly being suspended and expelled. Now, you would know um, the application for expulsion in the Western Cape Education Department. I'm going to use 2019 because the years after that is not a true reflection. We had 373 applications for expulsion in 2019, of which 135 was drug-related applications wow. or reasons for expulsion. So a third of applications are drugs or related to drugs. And one of the things that we've also realized, the younger the child, the more serious the impact it has mm. on that child. And mm. because um, it affects the mental well-being of that young child that's now using drugs, and this could extend into adulthood, and this could lead to psychiatric uh, disorders such as schizophrenia, depending on what the child use and the duration of use, um, and could lead to lower level of psychological uh, well-being and subsequent it could also create uh, interrupt the, the executive mental function of the child so uh, how does this impact on on schooling we would not be able to teach the child in the way he should be taught mm -hmm. and unfortunately the central person that needs to deal with that phenomenon would be the teacher and mm -hmm. teacher would often complain what market me different different as um He's the same in my class, or he's, he's drunk in my class. Now, one thing you need to keep in mind, drug uh, use rewires the learner's purpose and participation in education, but also draws the system to re-educate the learner. Now, we are then compelled to do something different to, to, to re-educate this learner. Now, that responsibility bears heavily on the teacher, as I've mentioned. Although, you need to keep in mind that the drug master plan is a department of social response, social development responsibility, not an education responsibility. Education has three functions in that drug master plan that is run by social development, and that is prevention, early intervention, and advocacy. Now, um, that is one of the th uh, things that this panel and all the people joining this discussion needs to keep in mind that the responsibility lies with part of social development and as education and health and community, we are partners to, to make that drug master plan uh, a reality. Mm -hmm. Now, educate, education is di directly impacted or implicated yes. by the child that uses drugs in the classroom. Yes, mm -hmm. yeah. 
Oké, okay, en so Neville, hoe gebruik die WKOD die, die curriculum dan? Hoe gebruik die WKOD die curriculum om hier die probleem aan te spreek? Wie weet jy, um, Ilse, die WKOD is een curriculum, curriculum is een breer, breer concept. Ja. Curriculum uh, isn't just uh, what the child learns in that moment when you have, when that period for mathematics or life orientation happens. Curriculum is everything that happens within that school space. And that is what we need to embrace and to understand. So it's, it's the culture that lives within that school that guides a child to have an appreciation for what happens there. Now, if we speak about how does the, how is the curriculum used in the school, the first thing would, would, be, uh, would be life orientation. Life orientation is a very important subject. There's been a move in this country by different lobbies where they say life education should be scrapped. But I can tell you, if life education often makes sense to the realities that these kids find themselves in. If taught well, if the teacher uses that curriculum as a tool, so that would be the primary teaching tool in the classroom space that the teacher would have access to. Now, the director of inclusive education, that is the, uh, the director that I'm part of, we're also introducing uh, building resiliency through play. Now, this uh, was born out of COVID-19, where we realized that kids need to play and we need to create safe play spaces within schools. Uh, that schools are not these hard places where kids often identify um, hardship with. That schools are a place where kids can play. So uh, one of the programs that, that we would like to introduce into schools and community spaces is uh, building resiliency through, through play, creating safe play spaces. A very important uh, program within the WCED, as all of you would know, would be safe schools. Without safe schools, we would not have a very good uh, indicator as to how safe schools are or uh, whether we are um, um, picking up on community uh, issues that influence schools. So safe schools plays an important part and uh, after school programs is, is one of the things that, that, that the curriculum would allow kids to, to have. But also the after school space is also uh, um, used by DCAS, Department of Culture and Sport. And you would know that, that they would create these uh, after-school uh, mod centers or hubs. Uh, and the purpose of those after-school programs would be to extend the school day. That the child wouldn't have the need to go home. My can spill by school. And get something to eat. And, and that child is allowed to, to play within a safe space. Um, so, so that would be also part seen as part of that uh, curriculum. <clears throat> the um, <clears throat> sorry, the other program that, that, that the Western Cape government is now starting, and some of you might know about it or might be hearing it for the first time as I say it right now, is the Violence Prevention Initiative at Schools. It's initiated, initiated by the Office of the Premier, and we've pre-piloted it last year, and we're piloting it this year. The reason why we're doing it in this stage is to get it right. Uh, and uh, what we'd like to do is to work directly with learners, to teach them about uh, um, anti-violence um, practices that we would like to teach them, because often, skill, often kids don't know how to do things differently. We often assume they can't get what reason for kids name would do, but but if he hasn't been trained into doing what is right and to acknowledge and to also identify um, options to do things differently, then he's not going to do it differently. Our new HOD, Mr. Brent Walters, he, uh, is very serious about integration of services within the WCD. He said that one of the things that he observed is that uh, we do a lot of wonderful things, but it's not well integrated. Right? And that's perhaps a criticism that many people would have of the WCD. And one of the things that he said we need to do, and that's our priority, one of the priority focus, focus points would be wellness and psychosocial support. That we need to look at the well-being of teachers, and of course, at the psycho well-being, social well-being of learners. So if you speak about curriculum, we speak about all of that. It's the culture that mm -hmm. we would like schools to adopt. Yes, yes, I like that. Iver, I come by you, I come, Iver, you work with you. You are in, in the lab, you are in real camp, you are in this, this is your work's umgeving. 
Wat zou jij sê, was die effect, of wat ik in Engels stel, what was the effect of the, did, did, did the legality of cannabis for personal use play a role in the increase of substance abuse under, under the youth? Ja, dankie. Ek, men sal naïef wees om te denk dat dit, dit nie um, daartoe bijgedra dat, dat die jong mense um, meer en meer um, dwelms gebruik nie, of, of kom ons sê dagga gebruik nie, want dit is ook soos het sê, dit is, goed, dit is ook goedkoop om, om te kry en nou het hulle meer toegang tot dit. En omdat hulle ook, hulle, basically, hulle lewe op die, op, die, op die internet. So wat maak is die, 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 die gap tussen waar in Amerika, music videos, internet stars, celebrity culture, hulle gebruik rondom dit, music stars, role models, film stars, hulle gebruik rondom um, 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 dagga, geef vir die kinders, geef vir jong mense dikwels toegang. But if, if they using it and they and, and they found it legal and they actually lobbying for it and they um, being activist of, of uh, for for the legalization of it, then it must be good for me. Now there's a difference with a 15 year old using Daha versus a 50 year old using um, using using Daha. We see we see on 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 the internet with different schools in our country the videos the the content that are popping up of daha usage in 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 schools now i don't know if it's just because they feel more at ease to share those type of content or whether it's been like this um um the, for long but you see this and there's definitely an increase in young people um not being afraid to use Dacha, make a video about that and share those that content uh, yeah. possibly possibly uh, online. So I, I think we would we would be naive to think that, that the legalization of it does not have an effect on the spike of usage in uh, in, in, in our in our schools. Yeah. It's amper as if it moeder geraak het om om dit te wijs. Yeah if you look at it Ja, as ek kyk na, die, soos net die, 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 die dag van 420, ek kyk altyd op, 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 op TikTok, op Instagram, hoe baie jong mense, you, you would never assume they would, they are uh, dag a smoke or whatever, but they would celebrate happy 420. Um, yeah. uh, and, and it's wide, it's wide, it's widespread. Yeah. So it becomes part of a new fashion trend if you're part yeah. of the conversation. Um, whether you're using it or not, we can speculate about it, but they want to be part of the conversation. And a lot of them, for a sense of belonging, they would they would actually go uh, and use it. Now, ons weet, hoe baie van hulle ook habli gebruik, en hoe baie van hulle dagga binnen in die habli gooi. So, so, so dit lijkt soos a harmless tool wat hulle na party toe vat, ten minste rook hulle nie draad, so hulle sê op tuk, by, by school party of whatever nie. Maar ons weet nie wat is die substance wat binnen in die, binnen in die hable is. Ja, ja. Um, ons het gepraat, toe ek en jy gepraat het, toe wat jy genoem van die uh, verskillende hantering van dwel en verslaafd is onder die verskillende socio-economische uh, klasse, sal ek nou maar sê. Um, vertel my daarvan. Ja, ek, ek, die, die, our assumption is always that, you know, in poor com- poorer communities, it is a bigger problem, and, and Quentin um, alluded to that, that it is a bigger challenge, because it's an escape, right? It was an escape for me. Um, the, 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 the challenge with that is that we assume then in our, in our wealthier communities, in our wealthier schools, um, that the problem is not as, as big. The problem, mm. the problem with that is they have, uh, uh, most of the time they have the means to cover up the problem. They have the means to, to, inter, to, to, to get intervention. They have the means to get, uh, 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 put a child in a, in a rehab. They have the means to, to, the school can quickly come up with a, 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 a custom-made program for the child. So it would, it, 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 we, we are fooling ourselves when we think it's not, it's not a problem in our uh, more wealthier uh, uh, communities. They just have the, the, the resources to deal with it in a harsh, 
in a rush uh, man, manner. Mm -hmm. Whereas mm -hmm. in, 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 in community that I grew up in a different poorer communities, it's 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 everywhere because as Quentin said, it's part of the the economic value value chain. So so if you have to eat tonight, you have to do what you have to do. But if yeah. but if you if you're bored or if you have all the all the everything that you, you want and need and your parents can provide, you you can you you can easily get drugs and be addicted to it and you would still be seen as a an example an example a, a child. Yeah, yeah. Um, so we can't say in some communities, no, this is not our problem or this is not a problem in our community. Actually, every community has got this problem. Yeah, def definitely. And, and, yeah. And, and, and in my, in my, in, I, I don't work as deeply in, in schools um, um, like, like the, the other panelists possibly, but, but I go, I visit a lot of schools just with storytelling, with uh, conversations, and, um, and and it's from Colini to Cape Town to Kimberley. So, so I see a broad spectrum of, and the, the cry is in all of the schools, it's the same. They just address, they, they, their briefing to me is just different, but, but you, if they would, we want you to come and motivate the kids. And then on the side end, they would say, you know, oh yeah, we we got a bit of a drug problem, but you know, and some of the schools would just would just say would call the problem. We have a we have a really yeah. we have a big problem with drugs in our schools, and yeah. so people other different schools phrase it differently, but the problem remains the same so, across the spectrum. Yep, yep. Neville, uh, you are the organizer and the manager of the Positive Behaviour yeah. Program of the WCED. How do you yeah. help schools with this? Uh, also, the, the, the Positive Behaviour Program uh, of the Western Cape Education Department was introduced into education uh, into education system in 2003. So, so uh, many people would not know that. Uh, but uh, since two, 2003, this whole program evolved. Uh, because we had to roll with the times, but also to, as legislation changed, we also had to look at uh, learner behavior differently. Mm -hmm. um, so it introduced a strength-based approach that is guided by restorative discipline practices. Now, many of these concepts are often not um, described in these terms, but often people find doing certain things that they can identify with and realize, but that is a restorative practice that, that I've done. Mm -hmm. Now, the strength-based approach, uh, I say that this as opposed to a punitive system. Yet there are many people still uh, crying out for punitive systems. They feel they must be a clamp down and, and there's be kind of slam. we have to beat the kids again so, so, so that we can get order. But, but that was one of the reasons why we had to restore order by taking the violence out of our caring, out of our support to learners. Now the drug master plan that I mentioned earlier assigned the responsibility of prevention, early intervention and advocacy programs to the education department. Now, the main focus of the positive behavior program is that of prevention. 80% of the program aims to capacitate um, the system towards preparing the soil for positive discipline. What does that mean? It means that as teachers come into, into the space and as schools prepare to, to, to do teaching, the space that the child enters into must be ready so the child would be enabled to behave positively. And I think Ivor mentioned a term earlier that resonates with me, and that is where they can uh, embrace the spirit of belonging. And, that, mm. that, and I'm saying spirit because it's almost like a religious thing that, that they need to embrace, needs to hit with the core of in terms of where they are coming from. So 80% of, of the program looks on, focuses on, on, on prevention. Now, the positive behavior support pathway, uh, uh, we call it that, it's a support pathway, it's a continuum of support. Uh, lines up with the CS support pathway. And many teachers know what, what the CS support pathway is. It's the instrument that is a pedagogical tool uh, that, that aims to uh, bring support into the educational space. So support uh, for learning is part and parcel of what a child needs to learn. So, so it, we, we, we uh, say it almost in one sentence. Now, education is not responsible for treatment 
and rehabilitation in terms of drugs. And that's the responsibility of the Department of Social Development and the Department of Health. Education is not capacitated to do treatment and to do uh, rehabilitation. There are other professionals and departments that does that. So uh, what the teacher needs to do through her or his observation uh, in the behavior support pathway is to observe and look at the child and realize but there's something peculiar about this child, the behavior is off, perhaps the child's intoxicated. It's for a teacher to kind of make that observation from the get go and to record it and then to intervene and to say, my child, are you okay? But the space or the culture of that classroom, the rules of the class would dictate what the teacher does next. So the teacher would then report or would seek the help of the school-based support team all schools in the Western Cape Education Department and in the country, this country, South Africa, must have a school-based support team. That is not unique to the Western Cape. It is something that the whole education system in this country must have. That is a school-based support team. That's the body of teachers that get together on a regular basis to discuss uh, support that should be given to learners so that teachers could also find strength in one another so that they can consult one another and, say, and, and, and uh, identify, listen, uh, Ilsa is in my class, she's very, very peculiar today. I think uh, she has smoked something weird because she's never like this, unbecoming Ilsa. So that the teacher could have that kind of support. Hence, intervention then happens with the parent, where a parent is then brought into the frame and say, mommy, please come and look at your child and uh, we just need to bring this under your attention. And then that observation happens. If we find that something seriously needs to happen, the school is at liberty to phone the safe schools hotline. There's a safe schools hotline uh, that, that is operational uh, all of uh, the day while the sun shines so that everybody can, can phone uh, the school um, and, in, and will be followed up the next day uh, should they need the help. So that the safe schools would come out and ensure that support gets to the school in terms of whatever they need. Um, should the child need support? And uh, I think it was uh, Dr. Adams who said earlier that um, there's not enough counselors. It's true, there's not enough counselors. Yeah. But that child gets referred to the district based support team as part of this continuum of support. And the district based support team would have a psychologist and a social worker and a learning support advisor attached to that team. So it's one team for a whole circuit. Now you can imagine there's a lot of uh, children uh, and a few professionals um, and uh, hence we also need to acknowledge that other places in this country they don't even have teams like that so 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 we must say it within that context so mm -hmm. that team will then respond to what this child needs in terms of drug support that the child is using drugs or behavior support and that child can either be referred to a program that is offered by the Department of Social Development or the psychologist on the team or the social worker on the team would, would take that child as a client and work with that child and the family to support that child. And that's in, in a nutshell is how this whole mm -hmm. behavior support pathway works within the program that I manage for the problems. But this is done against the backdrop of values driven education. Mm -hmm. and, uh, that is something that schools continuously need to advocate. Why values driven education? Because we need to instill an internal locus of control. That the child should know why they need to do things differently. Now, we also have another program called Transform to Perform, uh, which, is in, which, which in, is enabled to develop kids to develop growth mindsets. That, that uh, we need to develop them and teach them new skills. And as we inculcate these new skills, the child would inherently behave in a certain way, knowing that this is right for me. Now, the positive behavior program, uh, Ilsa, must also be seen against the backdrop of the national policy on drug abuse management in schools in South Africa. Now, many teachers of many schools are not aware of a national policy on drug abuse management in schools in South Africa. There is something like that. And it focuses on all the stuff that I just unpacked uh, in terms of what happens in the positive behavior program. And it's, it's also there to ensure that schools develop clear policies 
to deal with drugs in schools. The responsibility is the school governing bodies to, to develop a drug policy for that school, to see what are the um, trends within the school, what are the typical drugs uh, that is there, but also then to see to what, in which way can we collaborate with community stakeholders because the school is the community. Whatever happens in the community will happen in the school because the child wears those backpacks filled with invisible baggage. They bring mm. that into the classroom, into the school space, and it's inevitable that the life that the child lives outside the school will have an impact on what happens inside the school. So to capacitate teachers and to capacitate the school as a system to deal with, with that phenomenon, we are here to educate yeah. the whole child. Yes. Um, never look at how fun I like what you said about value driven schools and Quentin it links up with your program it's not value driven schools but with your program uh, which is which says discipline starts at home you've got a program that you run uh, um, that says discipline starts at home what does that entail yeah by um, the <clears throat> Die program het so ontstaan as gevolg van die opleving in bende geweld in 2013, 2012. Um, ek het navorsing gedoen in die Younger Township oor hoekom is die moordcijfer so hoog. En uh, net daarna toe vind die Anien Boysen moord plaas en ek het navorsing in Bredaasdorp gedoen. En een baie interessante trend het plaasgevind in Bredaasdorp, specifiek die Hermanus omgeving is dat ons het gevind dat baie van hierdie dwellings kom dier die coastal towns. Um, and that's why there's a, there's a direct link between drug abuse and the abalone industry, <laughs> or illegal abalone industry. And that's why we mustn't forget that because of that link, communities and especially uh, families are under, uh, under severe strain and pressure to deal with the usage and incidence of, of drug abuse. And so in 2012, I've started this program with Discipline Starts at Dome. I will never forget I was sent to Wooster area because it's a hotspot of, of gangsterism and drug abuse. And um, the, the, the program is basically to, to work with, with, with parents because I think it's very difficult for schools to mobilize parents. Um, most of the schools are using um, <clears throat> the letter as a means of communication. And you will often find, <clears throat> excuse me, the parents don't attend these uh, school governing body meetings. So what we have done is we have developed, uh, <clears throat> this is water. <laughs> <laughs> So what we have done is that we have developed a social mobilization mechanism how to mobilize parents to come to our um, workshops. And our workshops is really about a parent-to-parent -parent, uh, intervention. And um, the discussions that we're having is basically uh, based on seven principles, how to communicate with your child. There must be respect. There must be authority figure. Um, so... Since 2012, we have implemented and we have established this program in more than 125 communities in sure. more than six provinces in, in South Africa. But there's this just one thing that I would like to share with you tonight regarding this drug abuse and um, families. Most of the drugs are distributed by the gang culture. So the gangs have become the distribution network of mm. drugs. That is what sustained them. And secondly, the reason why we have such a widespread of drugs is because most of the drugs are coming through the coastal towns. Um, there are, in my research, I've discovered 23 foreign national drug, illegal drug agencies involved just in the Western Cape. So what we have to do is, and you know, when we listen to, 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 to Neville, and they are doing brilliant work in the schools, 
But unfortunately, the school is part of a broader community and they're not immune of what's happening within the, in, in, in the larger community. But I think the one missing link at this point in time in our offensive towards um, gangsterism and drugs is that we, we don't have enough parent involvement in the schools. Mm. Well, let me rephrase it. We don't have enough parents involved in the lives of their children. Um, that's why in, in Bradasdo, we've discovered that children are still walking between 12 and 2 o'clock in the streets. There's no supervision. There's uh, no control. There's no authority. There's, there's, there's nothing. And I think of all the brilliant efforts that, that the WCED are implementing, um, are brilliant interventions, but we have to bring the parents on board. And that's why we have decided to, to focus our attention with the discipline starts at home really on the parents, because the parents don't have the literacy level and sometimes the educational level to understand what is really happening. And, and the last point that I would like to make is that part of the drug master plan uh, part of the drug master plan was the local drug action committees and the, the local drug action committees in the community are non-existent. Um, they struggle to get people on board in terms of the uh, local drug action committees. And that's why we have started this movement, um, Discipline Starts at Home, to really work with the real issues, the anger, the frustration, the drug abuse, and I, and I must be honest with you, one of the biggest problems that parents are struggling with is the drug abuse because it, it is a means of an income, it's a means of survival, they, uh, they, and especially in our gang um, infested communities, it's so difficult to separate the, the drugs from, from, from the gang activities. And that's why um, we have started this program because I, I, I really believe that um, that we have to mobilize the community. We need to empower them, capacitate them, how to deal first and foremost with their own, own situation. And um, if we look at, especially at the high incidence of violence and aggression, and especially violent crime, most of the violent crime in, in families is because of the use of, of, of metaphetamine. And, 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 and parents don't have the skills. We are now at the point where parents, they fear their own children. They, they don't even know how to manage them. They, they can't wait and they pray that, that the school must open so that they can send their kids to the school so that the, that the teachers must deal with the kids. And that's why I think that there's a huge opportunity that we have to mobilize the, we need to know how to mobilize the, the parents. We need to know how to capacitate them. And it's a very difficult, very difficult uh, audience and sector to work with, because some of them have such a great animosity towards the school. They don't want mm. to come to school. Um, some of them, it is so dangerous. Um, we, we, we were in a community the other day, uh, there were gang shootings all over. They, 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 they can't attend um, uh, meetings because of the, because of the shootings. So it's very difficult for, for them to come to school. There's one community that we work, there are four primary schools, there's only one high school. And I've plotted all those areas in that one community and there are about nine to 11 um, gangs based in that community. So if there's a parent meeting, they don't pitch up for the parent meeting because they have to go through these different territories and it's very difficult for them. So we have developed a, localized intervention strategy with discipline starts at home where we work with the parents we know how to mobilize and i must be honest with you it's 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 tremendously successful because some of our meetings we get 1200 parents we get 800 uh, parents and, and and it's very important i i think that, that that to work with parents is a specialized field we need to know and understand how they operate how they work how they think um, how power networks are working in order for them to get them uh, on board. And, and, and to be honest with you, um, I think that, that we need to develop critical mass, critical mass in terms of uh, more pe parents needs to become parenting coaches. And we are now busy with that transition of just presenting workshops to them, where we're giving them so that they can become 
um, the spreaders of this, what we call the virus, um, because when it spreads like a virus, it becomes contagious, stickable, and it and, mm. and more people will adopt it so that we can uh, get what we call critical mass. And I think what is important is that when I look at what's happening within the homes in, in most of these Western Cape schools, I have a huge respect for teachers because mm. those, those kids are in control. Some of them in the gang infested um, their homes and their houses became drug dens and, and, and they, because there was a time when we were just thinking about gang affiliation. It's not just gang affiliation anymore. It is kids selling weapons and ammunition. That's why the violent crime is so high in the Western Cape. I mean, we're the fourth high, highest, fourth highest um, murder capital in, in the world. I mean, and then it's because of this violent crime that we are dealing with. And that's why we have to get to the parents. We have to go into the community and we have to meet with them. Uh, some of our strategies, we even go into the taxi ranks. Uh, we have a team, we call them the bomb squad. They go into the taxi ranks and we, we work with the parents. And when it is Sasa day, then we, they're standing in the queue and we have our small uh, um, pamphlets and we work with them regarding how to get control back, how to speak to your child. And a very worrying factor is, is that these gangsters, they understand what's happening with the police. So what happened is there's a shift now. In the olden days, it was usually this naughty boy that was selling the drugs at the school. Now they're looking for the prefect. They're looking for um, um, this boy with, yeah. with, that, that can attract and, 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 and connect with more people. But the uh, uh, last thing that I would like to say is that we, we have to focus on the girl, the girl child also. Because what the gangsters have realized now is that don't use boys to sell drugs use young girls because most of that police vans uh, have men in it. So when it comes to stop and search, they can't search them because it's, it's, it's only a men in the, in, the, in the police van. And I can recall two years ago, three, uh, three years ago, we had to remove eight young uh, girls between the age of 12 and, and 16 because they became part of the gang and they became part of, of, of selling drugs to the schools. So I think it's important that we have to mobilize the parents. We need to speak to them. It's a very yes. difficult uh, job to, to really get to them. But I think with, the, with this program, Discipline at, uh, Starts at Home, we've started to, to, to focus on it and to make sure that we get to the parents, which is a very difficult yes. job to do. Yeah, yeah. It's, it's so mm. important that parents get involved in combating this problem. We can't do it alone. But Ava, um, Quinton referred to the role that teachers play, but I want to, um, in your book uh, that I mentioned, you said that there was a certain teacher that played, or she, the role that she played changed your life. Can you quickly just, just tell us about that, the role that she yeah. played and what happened in your life? Yeah, I was, I was, at that time, I was in Brantley uh, prison with a six year, six month sentence. And I was part of the 26 gang in prison. And, and, and that teacher with the empathy, with the, she saw, she saw uh, beyond, beyond the, the tattoos, beyond the, the gang number, beyond the, the activities in, in prison. And uh, one Friday afternoon, I uh, assaulted a guy and she came to visit me in the in the solitary room that I, that, I, that I was in. And she spoke to me as if I truly, truly, truly matter. As if my life is not just some wasted echo and I have to serve my time and go back to, go back to gangs and drugs. She spoke to me as if I, for the first time, could realize I matter and I have something of potential in me. And, and, and she just made a, a comment with regards to, uh, um, when, when, if you should die, what is the biggest, biggest story that will be told about your life? And, and at that point, I knew the only story was that I have these 26 gang tattoos and uh, I, I was in for murdering my brother and that's it. And she said, but I want, I want to help you rewrite. And that's the important thing. I want to help you rewrite the narrative that you were given. Because a lot of us, broken boys we were given a narrative without our choosing 
And she said, I want to help you rewrite the narrative. And she enrolled me for matric in prison because she understood the value. If she could get me to finish school in prison, I had no dream of my own. I had no idea of what will I do with a matric certificate. She just made me realize the importance of getting something behind my name. And, and, and it must have been the empathy that she showed because they, there was other people that tried to encourage me to, to do school. But she spoke to me as, as if I am not, I'm a human being, not a gangster okay. with a with a prison prison uh, record, y'all. Mm, sure. Yo, I, I get goosebumps here if you talk about that because that's such a powerful testimony of what can happen if we invest in 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 these in these children's lives. Uh, we can make a difference. Thank you very much, Quinton and Ava and Neville. We're running out of time. I quickly want to bring Yaku in. Yaku, thank you. So. Yaku, you've heard the panelists speak, you have, you've heard the, uh, the questions and answers. Is there a legal obligation on schools to address drug abuse in relation to the in loco parenti obligation or the instruction? Yes, also the in loco parenti simply means that when a parent or a guardian is not present, the adult at school will fulfill the position um, as the parent of the child. So I must act as if I'm the parent. So in that sense, at school, there's definitely an obligation but or at the school activity. But we know that the main place of abuse or the use is not necessarily at school or during a school activity. So they've got only partial responsibility in that sense. But if you look at the obligation of your school governing body, they must provide an atmosphere where education can take place. So if the child is either intoxicated or the child fears for his or her life uh, because of the circumstances at home, then education won't take place. So th that's part of the role of your governing body, though I don't think it's really an education issue. It's a societal issue that plays out in our schools. And that, that's where we need to work in the partnerships as school communities to don't feel alone. Let, let's start there. Reach out. Reach out. There is help. I don't think there's a quick fix. Um, and I think we would do injustice if we simply say there's a webinar, there's a number, your problems will be fixed. It, it, will, be a, it will take a massive community effort to deal with it. Um, on a national level, yes. But on a national level, it won't really address the problem at your school, in your community. So we need to bring it down to those communities and be part of movements like deal with that, assist the parents with parenting skills, to work with Quinton, to, to get Ivor on board and to just get Ivor's story out, to say somebody, somebody said there's more to life, a single person, and he changed Ivor's life. And again, like Neville said, there is support within the educational sector. My, my plea is tonight, Ilza, is to really go back to our communities and take stock. What's available? In all communities, we do have religious networks of our religious organizations, your churches and so forth. But let, let's take it broader as our religious community. Who are the NGOs who's working in your, in your direct community? Look at it, the resources provided by the department and then start to work in those multidisciplinary teams. Set up your teams um, and get help. I think that that's, that's the message I'm getting tonight is we need more information. So the information Quinton shared with us is crucial that we shouldn't only battle this within our school community. They would just touching the tip of the iceberg, but to really work with, within the communities and to put more information into the hands of our parents. The sad story is, in terms of the own research that we've done at FEDSAS, is 47% of our 17-year-olds currently in the school system are living with a single parent, and that's normally the mother. Mm. So, so the whole structure, the family structure changed. The, the absence mm. of father figures 
uh, or the absence of, of good role models. Let, let me take it a bit further. So I'm looking forward to the other discussions, but I'm not in despair. I, I'm, I'm shocked mm -hmm. and I want to cry for our beloved country. We should be. But let's start somewhere. It's that one person who can make a difference. Do your stock take in your community. Reach out to the experts and the different associations and organizations, NGOs working in your direct community. If they don't know, you do have the numbers of our experts and they also work in networks. So they'll be able to, to point you in a direction, but start somewhere. The cycle can be broken. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You're so, muted, Ilse. Yeah, I, I, yeah, thank you. I get, I get no idea by my name. I get the honor for being a by my. So it was, it was such an honor to talk to you all. But the basic message, like Yaku said, we cannot do it alone. We need to take hands with all our partners. Ivor, you said it. Quentin, you said it. Neville, you said it. We need to take hands. Thank you to all of you gentlemen thank you for giving your time and energy for for this panel discussion we are not for the uh, people at home we are not going to lose you here uh, or leave you here we're going to lose you but we're not going to leave you here we will have a quarterly panel discussion to give you tools to give you hope to link you up with people in the in the um, outside of schools that you can uh, link with, like Yaku said. I quickly want to share, just share our details with you. Um, let me just get there. Um, then you can, there is the panelist. There are our details uh, with the different districts that we, that we are located in. Please take our contact details down um and contact us if you have any questions and i'm going to share you the panelist details there is quinton's details and Ava and neville's de details please contact them if you want them to help you in your school or if you just want advice with your uh, with a problem you have in school in your school but please contact them and um and yeah just get in contact with us so what is the first thing that you need to do now is identify the partners in your community that's the first thing that you need to do now identify your partners connect with them tell them that you've got a plan how are we going to do this and then the next time that we talk we will give you the tools. We will give you the markers that you need to set in to get eventually to, uh, to your goal. With that, thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you, Quentin. Thank you, Neville. Um, I just want to share my uh, screen with you again. And with that, I'm going to leave you there. You must have a wonderful evening. Thank you for your time. All the people at home, thank you for your time after hours. Um, and we appreciate it. We will get to your, your questions that you've asked and you will get a copy of this uh, discussion tomorrow or the day afterwards. We will send it to you. Thank you and enjoy your evening. Bye-bye. <laughs>